All right, so what we are going to do with this lecture is really just derive the ideas or the, the equations behind simple harmonic motion. Um, at this point, you've done the experiment and you've seen the results, you've shared them with each other, and we've gone over them a little bit. So hopefully you should, you should have an idea of what simple harmonic motion looks like, the oscillation back and forth, and this is really just going to give some mathematical foundation to it. Uh, in a previous video, I had shown you um, just a review of forces uh, with springs, and we had looked at Hooke's Law. And we're really going to derive everything that we need from Hooke's Law and Newton's Law. And so just to very briefly review, when we displace the mass, the spring mass system, off to one side, the force exerted by the spring goes in the opposite direction. When we compress it, the force tries to expand it. And this idea of a force that is constantly resisting the displacement and resists it proportionally, just in the opposite direction, is the defining characteristic of simple harmonic motion. And so we can do that with a number of different things, but we're going to start off with springs and then we'll, we'll go to pendulums. So here we have uh, sum of forces equals m times a, and we only have the one force in this case, which makes it nice, this is the force of the spring, and that equals the mass times the acceleration. I go ahead and I plug in the opposite of kx equals m times a, and nothing too unusual here. This is the part that takes on a new importance uh, because it really gives rise to the whole simple harmonic motion idea. We call this a characteristic of a restorative force. Okay, and that what that means is that it goes in opposition to the, the displacement. So this means opposes displacement. And it doesn't matter which direction the mass is going. So the mass could be on its way out to this amplitude, or it could be on its way back from this amplitude. The restorative force doesn't care. It just wants to get the mass to go back to equilibrium. So the restorative force opposes displacements. And all that I'm going to do now is I'm just going to rearrange this equation just slightly, and I get the opposite of k over m times x equals a. And one of the things that you noticed from your lab was that the position obviously is changing with time, and the acceleration changes with time as well. So these are both dependent upon the time, depending on where you're looking at it. If you look at it at the time right here, if this is the time, then you'll notice that the, the, um, the displacement is at its maximum. And it turns out that one of the things that this equation is saying is that the acceleration is also at a maximum at this point. Okay? At some other point, say right here, the displacement is zero, and so the acceleration is also zero at that point during the simple harmonic motion. Uh, what does come out of this is that you wind up with perhaps a large velocity at equilibrium. Um, now, we'll get into the specifics, specifics of that later, but one of the key things here is, yeah, they're proportional to each other. So when the displacement's larger, the acceleration's going to be larger. When the displacement's smaller, the acceleration will be smaller. And hopefully that also came out, at least to some extent, um, in, your, in your investigation. Although it might not have come out directly, uh, you, hopefully you, you can look back at the results and, and, and make sense of that. And we'll look at some cases in the future that hopefully demonstrate this as well. Now this is actually a pretty difficult problem. Uh, for those of you who are calculus buffs, you recognize that this is actually the second derivative of the position function. So the acceleration function is the second derivative of the position function. And we can solve that um, fairly simply by, by using a little bit of trig. And we had already used some trig to describe the motion when I was demonstrating the idea behind simple harmonic motion, where we really um, analyze this in terms of going in the circles. And what we can do is, first of all, I'm going to redefine this. This is going to be redefined as omega squared x of t equals a of t. And this omega squared 
Well, omega is equal to the square root of k over m. And this omega stands for angular frequency. Uh, what that means is that if you have that unit circle, okay, so if you have a circle like so, uh, maybe you imagine it to actually be a circle. So you have a circle like so, and the point on the edge of this, or actually really any point, it doesn't really matter where, travels through a certain angular displacement at every interval of time. So it has what we call an angular frequency. And what that would look like is, uh, let's do a little brief comparison here. What this looks like then is that if I have regular frequency, which we, we designate with an, a little f, that's the number of cycles per second. Angular frequency is the number of radians per second. I'm not really going to get into it too much that this is the same symbol that we use for angular velocity, which also means radians per second. But the idea here is that this is an object that's moving at a constant angular velocity. It has a constant um, sort of rate of movement about the circle. So all we need to really do to relate these two together is we can say that the angular velocity, I'm sorry, the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi times f times the frequency. So all that we have to do is we take the number of cycles that you go through per second and that's equivalent to the uh, radians you go through per second if you multiply by 2 pi. So just to, to carry this through to completion, if we had a linear frequency of say 2 hertz, that's 2 cycles per second. So that means that the angular frequency would be 2 pi radians times 2 cycles per second, which would give us 4 pi radians per second. They're equivalent statements. 2 hertz, 2 cycles per second, is the same thing as 4 pi radians per second. And the part that is a little bit strange is that we treat this thing that's clearly just going back and forth in a straight line, the spring oscillating back and forth. We claim that it has this angular frequency, and we do that because we pretend like it's going in that circle. Um, if you have questions about that, uh, it doesn't quite make sense. Go back and watch the, the videos where, where I explain that. Um, it is a, a little bit of a challenging concept. But in any case, what we wind up with is this idea of an angular frequency. If we square that angular frequency, multiply by the position, we get the acceleration. Um, looking at this angular frequency, because this is time dependent, what this is saying is that if the spring is more springy, if that k value is higher, then it will oscillate back and forth more rapidly. And this should make sense because if k is bigger, that means that there's more impetus to move the mass back towards equilibrium. So it is going to oscillate faster. It also indicates that if the mass is bigger, the angular frequency is smaller, meaning that the number of cycles that it goes through per second gets smaller. This should also make sense. The larger mass means more inertia, more resistance to changes in motion. So for a given force trying to pull it back towards equilibrium, it's harder to actually get it to go back towards equilibrium. Um, and so it, it behaves more sluggishly. And both of these results should have come out in your experiment. And we could see that in the shapes of the results that you should have gotten. In the one case, you should have gotten something like this, where when you were comparing the period to the k value, you should have noticed that it gets, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger but it does start to, to kind of drop off. If, on the other hand, you were to compare the mass um, versus the, the period, the mass, actually, I, I did this a little bit backwards. This will be mass. So the mass actually extends the period. The period gets larger and larger as you have more mass. Um, the, the k value causes the period to diminish. So it starts off quite large, 
if you have a k value of zero, it never actually goes back. So imagine that I have a spring here that has a, a k value of zero. It has no restorative properties. You stretch it out, it just stays put. So the period, we would call that an infinite period. This is going up towards infinity. On the other hand, with the mass, um, when the mass is zero, there's no resistance to changes in motion. So it just flies back and forth um, in almost no time at all. So that, that explains these kind of initial conditions. Um, I'm going to stop this video right here for now to give you a second to digest this information. And then I'm going to look into this equation just a little bit more um, for a couple of minutes, and then we'll go into pendulums.